Hey, good morning, students. How are you guys today? Good? Okay, first of all, I am not Jason Sandoval. Jason Sandoval is the small guy back there. That he's my boss, though. So my name is uh, Rod Rape. Um, and if you're wondering why I'm wearing the James Allen Trojan stuff, I'll tell you why. I have two sons that go to school here. One's a junior, one's a freshman, and my twin daughters will be coming to this school in the next two years. So I have a vested interest in this school and in this community. I am actually an agent with the United States Drug Enforcement Administration. We are tasked with enforcing the federal narcotics laws of the United States of America. I've been with DEA for 22 years. I'm the old guy now. I used to be the young guy, but now I'm the old dinosaur in my office. Uh, when I got on with DEA, I spent five years in New York City. I left New York City about a month after 9-11, transferred to Birmingham, Alabama, and spent five years there, and I moved to Charleston in 2006. So I live here on James Island. Like I said, I have a vested interest in the community. And I also have a vested interest in this school. I've been to numerous schools to talk. I've, I've been to Stratford. I've been to Burke. I've been to Stahl. And now this is really the first time I've had an opportunity to come to, to James Island to, to talk to the school that I, I really care about. So, and in every other school that I've went to, I've worn my James Island stuff. I'm proud of James Island. I would love an opportunity to go and talk to Wando so I could wear my James Island stuff over at Wando. Uh, they haven't asked for us yet, though. So if they do, I promise you, and when I go there to talk, I'll be wearing exactly what I'm wearing today. Um, what does DEA do? Like I said, DEA is the Drug Enforcement Administration. We're not an agency, we're an administration. Administration means we do paperwork. But we also enforce the federal drug laws of the United States. We work cases from the ground up. We utilize informants. We send informants out to make buys, drug buys from our targets. We conduct surveillance on our targets to see who they are associating with. And at the end of the day, we try to put together a prosecutable case so that we can indict them and then ultimately arrest our targets. So we conduct surveillance. There are times where we do wiretaps. We listen to what their phone conversations are. But the best part of my job is at the end of the day, I get to put people in jail and we get to execute our own search warrants and we execute our own arrest warrants. So we basically build a case from the ground up and we see it all the way through fruition to prosecution. Um, since I've been with DEA, I started out in New York City working hundreds of kilos of cocaine coming into New York City, cases like that. Obviously, we don't have hundreds and hundreds of kilos of cocaine coming into the Charleston area. But one thing that's changed for me since I've been with DEA is when I first started, it was all about enforcement, 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 putting bad guys in jail, bad guys that are selling drugs in jail where they deserve to be. And over time, I can say that's changed for me. I still want to put bad guys in jail, but I also now enjoy this aspect of my job, educating young kids. I enjoy going to schools and talking to young kids. I enjoy seeing the light in their eyes and the hopes and dreams that they have of a future after high school, potentially into college and after college. So for me, initially it was all about enforcement. Now it's changed. It's still about enforcement because that's still my job is to put bad guys in jail. But it's my job also to educate the young people in this country and to let them know the issues that we're having with drugs and overdose deaths with drugs now. I think all you guys are, are young, and if you're young, you're prone to make mistakes. But now, with drugs, the mistakes that you make can kill you. They can kill you. So today, we wanted to come to talk to you about drugs, about, especially about the opioid and heroin epidemic that our country is facing today, which is 
40 times worse than what the crack epidemic was back in the 80s. Obviously, y'all weren't alive back in the 80s, but unfortunately, I was. But it's 40 times worse than the crack epi epidemic. So I'm going to be a speaker. My boss, Jason Sandoval, is a speaker. And then we have two other individuals that are going to talk to you today. This will be my first time to hear their stories, but I'm excited to hear their stories about addiction and about recovery and about hope. And I want to hear their stories firsthand, and I think you guys need to hear their stories, to hear about how they got addicted, but also to hear about how they've been able to recover and straighten their lives out. I'll turn it over to Jason. Morning, everyone. So the pictures on the screen and the little bit of background that Rod told you all about his career, that's really what DEA's primary focus is. And we do investigate drug crimes and we do put people in jail. And everybody that we've ever put in jail usually has an arrogance about them. And they started out dealing and distributing drugs thinking they were never going to get caught and they always end up getting caught. You can ask Pablo Escobar and Chapo Guzman and any of the cartel leaders who always felt that they were insulated in their in their cultures. And that goes all the way down to the street dealers here in Charleston. Uh, every single one that we've arrested uh, during my time here I can't believe that their, that their day finally came due, that the reckoning finally happened upon their heads. And as much as I want to talk about that, because that's the fun, exciting part of our job, that's the stuff that you sometimes see in TV with us all wearing our Kevlar and banging a door down. Um, I I'm here to talk to you because we are facing a national crisis. Um, and it's a crisis largely driven by misinformation. And it's misinformation that is particularly acute in your age group. Um, there's a belief uh, in your age group, subconsciously, consciously, I don't know where it resides in the human brain, but that we can use and abuse drugs without any consequences. Some of it, I think, is driven by the popular media. Some of it's driven by music. Molly, Percocet, Molly. Yes, I've heard that song. Uh, some of it's driven by Satan, as I call her, or you might know her better as Miley Cyrus. Uh, she likes to glamorize her own use of Molly and cocaine. And I can tell you that the wealthy people in Hollywood and the wealthy people who glamorize drug use, who legitimize drug use, who normalize drug use, they're wealthy. And they can afford the 20, 30, 50, 60 thousand dollar rehabs every time they fall off the wagon. You and me and the average American, we can't afford that. But where is this starting? And I'll tell you where it's starting. It starts with the answer to this question on the screen. Who knows the answer to that question? D, you got it. All right, so we're starting out on a good foot. You all passed the test. Everybody gets 100%, Miss Brandon, okay? Um, and, and it starts there. And why is that problematic? And I'll tell you why it's problematic. The other four drugs on there, Rod and I and our entire team of investigators and analysts, we can go out and investigate the people bringing those drugs to our country, bringing those drugs to our streets, selling those drugs to young people. Prescription drugs are sitting in your medicine cabinets. They're sitting in your grandparents' medicine cabinets. They're sitting in your friends' medicine cabinets. And there's a belief, and I don't know why, I don't know how it started, but there's a belief that you can use and abuse these drugs particularly without any consequences because, and this is why I, where I think it comes from, pharmaceutical company produced it, doctor prescribed it, pharmacist dispensed it. What's dangerous about that? There's not a thing, right? There is. Prescription drugs are scheduled in the exact same way under, under the United States Code, under United States law, as cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, and any of the other traditional street drugs. What does that translate to? If your name is not on the medicine bottle and you take those drugs, you have committed a crime. If your name is not on the medicine bottle and you hand those drugs out to a friend, you have committed a crime. 
you are a drug dealer. Now, we're not going to come banging your door down the first time you hand out your Percocets or the first time your friends start parting off of their mom and dad's Percocets, but it leads to a spiral of problems in your life when you use and abuse these drugs. They're not safe. Know that. The first time somebody offers you an Oxy-30 that grandma had it in her medicine cabinet when she got her hip replaced, if you take that drug and you're not feeling pain, your body is not interpreting it as a painkiller it doesn't need. Your body is interpreting that, your brain is interpreting that as a hit of heroin. There's no difference. Your body does not distinguish between the two. So, the reality of this problem that we face is that the, the untruths, the mistruths, the misinformation about the crisis that we're currently in is that you can't become an addict because a pharmaceutical company dispensed it. Our pharmaceutical company produced it. Doctor prescribed it. Pharmacist dispensed it. It's a lie if anybody tells you you can't become an addict to prescription drugs. Flat out lie. How many of y'all know that heroin in the 1800s was first manufactured as the be-all cure-all for pain, postpartum pain, and for children's coughs. It was marketed as heroin. That was on the label. It's no different. These drugs that are in the medicine cabinet chemically are 80 to 95 percent at the molecular level identical to heroin and that's why they have the exact same effect on your brain. They have the exact same effect on your body if you're parting with them as it is if you stuck a needle in your arm and injected heroin in it. And the problem, we are in a national crisis, and that's not exaggeration. That's not we as DEA trying to make more of something than there is, because trust me, um, this part of our job, we have no way to quantify if we reached any of you. But I can tell you that the deaths that we are seeing as a result of this crisis, it, it's unprecedented. How many of y'all in history class, y'all studied the Vietnam War, I'm sure, right? How many people died during the Vietnam War? There's a, a wall in Washington, D.C. dedicated to the soldiers who died. It was about 58,000 soldiers. In 2016, in the United States of America, due to drug overdose deaths, we lost 64,000 Americans. In 2017, that number is expected to probably crest 80,000. Every single day, today, yesterday, last week, every day, we are losing 175 Americans to drug overdose deaths. And of those drug overdose deaths, and that's all of them, cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, prescription drugs, of those drug overdose deaths, we're losing 110. 110 people every single day for people who took either prescription drugs or their street cousins, heroin, fentanyl, car fentanyl. It's not a joke. It's not a party. I can tell you, if you take that drug and you have a genetic predisposition to addiction, you can become an instant addict. And you're not going to stay in the medicine bottle for very long because you're not going to be able to get a supply of them. And you can be out on the street within a couple months putting needles in your arm when you thought you never would. Go ahead. Guys, just to expand on what um, my boss talked about, when he, when he first got to South Carolina, he wanted to start a heroin initiative. So we focused a lot on going out, using our... And and buying and purchasing heroin. And at the end of the day, after we bought and purchased heroin, we tried to do a big roundup, which we did back in October, and we arrested about 50 different people that were involved in the distribution of heroin. But literally, we are no longer becoming, we are no longer drug investigators. We get calls from the coroner on a daily basis about young kids that have overdosed and died and the coroners wanting us to try to figure out, well, who sold them the drugs that caused them to overdose and caused them to die. So we are also becoming homicide investigators. And we are doing our best to try to not only investigate the drug traffickers, but also to take it back to who sold somebody 
uh, the drugs that ultimately ended their life. And it's a daily basis. And addiction doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter if you're white or black. It doesn't matter if you're smart or dumb. It will affect you if you choose to go down that path. So I want to hurry up and get through what I have to say because I think the stories that my friend Wood and Thomas are going to tell you are, are going to hit home with some of you. Because of the way prescription painkillers are, are dispensed in our society, every single one of us, every demographic, whatever our skin color, whatever our gender, every single one of us is at risk. We're at risk because there's misinformation out there that these are somehow more legitimate than traditional street drugs. They are not. Hear it from me. I have literally sat down with more moms and dads than I ever dreamed I would in my career whose 16, 15, 14, 17-year-old kids died because they started jacking around with this stuff. 17-year-old girls, your age, 17-year-old girls allowing things to be done to their bodies to pay for their hit. I'm not saying that to scare you. I'm not saying that to be gross. I'm just saying it's a reality of this, and I don't want any of you. You are the future. You are what America is going to be. And if your generation ends up a generation of addicts, America is going to have a real problem. So I want you to think as you start, as Wood, Wood comes up on the stage, I'm going to pose a couple questions to you. you know, what, what's real to you? Is what Miley Cyrus and Bradley Cooper and Limitless what they, what they sing about and what they do in those films, is that real? Because I can tell you it's not. They're lies. Bradley Cooper, there's no pharmaceutical grade amphetamine that makes you both good looking and intelligent and able to get hot Italian models to fly across on G5s with you to the Amalfi Coast in Italy. Doesn't exist. If it did, I'd probably be going after that myself. Um, the other thing I want you to think about what do you want to grow up for? What's that all about? So you don't have to come sit in auditoriums like this and be herded around like, like cats by these crazy adults, right? I mean, we all, I was sitting in the same auditorium one day, not this exact one, but another one, hearing adults talk to me and tell me where to be and this and that. And I remember I used to think, gosh, I can't wait to have my own life and my own freedom. If you go down this path, the freedom that you want, it might feel like you're free because you're doing what you want to do, but if your path takes you into the rabbit hole of using and abusing drugs like this, it's not freedom at all because that drug owns you. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to my friend Wood Marchant from the College of Charleston. Hey, I'm Wood. Uh, I am a recovering addict. And I also run a program down at the College of Charleston for recovering students. Uh, and we have what is most easily described as a co-ed sober fraternity for sober students downtown Charleston. What we're finding is that younger and younger people are hitting their bottom, meaning reaching a low point due to their alcohol and drug use at younger ages. So we're talking... I've got a 20-year-old student who's been sober four years, started using in middle school, use increased cocaine, pills, marijuana in high school. She got sober at 16, four years sober. Her hope is that she will never take a legal drink because she knows if she drinks, heroin comes back into play. The other substances that help her hit her bottom come back into play. And so when I say I'm a sober individual, I hadn't had any alcohol, any marijuana, or any mood or mind-altering substances in over 20 years. And listen, there are a couple of moms here in this audience that knew me back when that can't believe I'm saying that. And I think they're kind of proud of me. Um, thank you. But my story's a little different in that what got me was just a little bit of weed. And the weed I was smoking back in the 70s and 80s is a whole lot crappier than the weed that's probably being sold 
and I hate to say this, administrators, either on this campus or nearby. And I hear some murmuring, and y'all know what I'm talking about. Um, just smoking a little weed. So I was a seventh grader in Charlotte, middle class family, decent athlete, but the guy that sold me my first joint was a basketball player on the ninth grade varsity, and he was a cool dude, and I wanted to be like him, and I have no idea why I said yes when he offered me that first joint, but I wanted to fit in. I wanted to be cool. I had a lot of friends with older brothers and sisters that smoked, and I felt like I was a little bit behind. I was the oldest in my family, and so I said yes, and that ended up being a 18-year relationship with marijuana. And I had no idea that that was going to happen when I said yes. And so I went off to this all-male boarding school. I didn't have a chance to party much there, uh, but I was one of the few kids that, caught dr that got caught drinking at that boarding school. Um, see, I have a family history of addiction, and my mother warned me about it, and I knew about it, but I said, I'm not going to be an alcoholic because I see what alcohol did to the men in my family. And so being conscious of that, I said, I'm not going to get in any trouble smoking just a little bit of weed. And so I got to the College of Charleston in 1984. And my first apartment downtown, we had an extra sofa. And these guys who lived upstairs said, hey, we'll trade you a bag of dope for that sofa. I was like, that's the best deal I've ever heard. And I, that began a college career of smoking every day, maybe going to classes, and BSing my way through college, um, telling every teacher, I'm sorry, my paper's not in, and having to come up with a lie. I was an English major, and boy, I could tell a story, but I couldn't turn in a paper on time. I somehow finished college, and I looked for that job, and I looked for that wife, and I looked for the path that was supposed to show up. It showed up for a lot of my friends, but it didn't show up for me because I was getting stoned every day. And I was smoking earlier and earlier in the day. And my smoking turned into how I hear alcoholics talk about their drinking. There are plenty of alcoholics towards the end of their drinking that have to have a drink the minute they get up. I had to get stoned the minute I drank up. So the paranoia would kind of start to lessen. And so I'd go to see therapists, and I'd go to see doctors, and I'd say, I'm really depressed, but I really wouldn't tell them what was going on. Yeah, I drink a little bit, and every now and then I smoke some weed. So they'd give me the new antidepressant for the day, the Prozac, the Zoloft, the Abilify, all that stuff. And I'd take it, but I wouldn't feel any better because I was still putting two depressants on top of the antidepressant. Excuse me, I was, yeah, two depressants. By that time, I was drinking a lot and I was still smoking weed every day. So here's the pattern I was in. I drink and I smoke because I'm depressed, but I'm depressed because I drink and smoke. You take two depressants every day, you're not gonna feel like a champ. And I struggled to keep a job, I struggled to keep a girlfriend, I struggled to make it on my own. So late into my 20s and in my early 30s, I hadn't figured it out yet. But it was just a little weed, right? Somewhere along the line, I cross, somewhere along the way, I crossed this invisible line, and I can't tell you where it was, but it got to the point, and we know marijuana is not physically addicting, but my mind sure as heck told me I needed it to be cool, to be calm enough to talk to the girls I really wanted to talk to, to be the funny guy at the party, and to really not care, because that's what weed does. It just lets you fly the I don't care flag. You know, you break up with me, I'm going to get stoned. I don't care. You fire me from a job, I don't care. I don't like this job anyway. You ground me for doing something that I shouldn't be doing, I don't care. I'm going to get stoned. But deep down, you care. And deep down, I really cared. And I didn't know a way out. And this was back in the 80s. I didn't know about rehab. I didn't know about asking for help. Because guys are supposed to be able to figure this out on our own. Um, what happened was I'd finally had enough. What happened was my toothbrush had moved its way into the shower because literally I could not look in the mirror anymore. That's a pretty sad place to be. For one, my toothbrush always tasted like soap, but I was also 
afraid of any mirror, and I never had any idea how my hair looked. So it was, it was shocking that that's where I got. And that paranoia they talk about with weed, it, I thought that meant that cops are coming, I'm going to get busted or something. I thought that's what paranoia meant. Paranoia for me was, what are they saying about me? What do they think about me? Why did that girl say no to me? I was stuck in my head, and that's what weed will do to you. And for y'all that are dabbling with it now, the weed you're smoking is better than what I was smoking, and addiction rates come a lot quicker. I used to work at the medical university a few years ago. What I learned was that you, if you use an addictive substance regularly before the age of 15, your early teenage years, and I'm talking regularly meaning a couple of times a month on the weekends, so for those of you who are vaping, for those of you who are smoking a little weed, for those of you who are drinking more than a little bit regularly, you've got a 95% chance of developing an addiction to something later in life. Who wants a 95 on their next test? 95% chance. So if you started playing with that stuff around the age of 15 and you're continuing to play with it now, there's trouble coming your way for some of you. And I can't tell you who it's going to be, but if you got a family history of mental illness, you got a family history of addiction, watch out. Because the places that addiction can take you, and I was lucky, you know, I wasn't a heroin addict, but I drove around Charleston looking for a tree to run into and looking for a bridge to drive off of because I couldn't ask for help. I figured if I got in a wreck, I could tell the guy in the ambulance, man, I need some help. I was too scared to talk to my parents. I was too scared to talk to anybody. But I finally, finally told a therapist the truth when I couldn't look in the mirror anymore, when that second girl in two months broke up with me. And as they were breaking up with me, they said, you need to call my therapist. Um, I finally got honest, and this, this awesome therapist who had the same story as I did said, I go to Alcoholics Anonymous for my problems. And I'm like, but I smoke weed. She said, go to an AA meeting, and every time you hear the word alcohol, substitute the word weed. And I did, and it clicked. I was in a room with other people who had the same problem as, as I did. And I keep going. So I'm 20 years sober. I keep going to those meetings because I'm, I'm with a, another group of people that understands what it's like to have to fight off the thought of having that glass of wine with dinner. You know, that, that have to fight off that thought, well, it's just a little bit of weed. For me, that takes me to a dark place. And so I'm honored to run this program at my college, the College of Charleston, where I went off the tracks years ago that helps sober students. We've got 17 of them this semester that are committed to staying sober downtown Charleston. Is downtown Charleston a very sober place? No. You imagine staying alcohol and drug free in the middle of the College of Charleston, you think that's easy? No. But these kids are doing it together. They found their own tribe and they're amazing kids. They're campus leaders. They make great grades and they are free. They don't have to worry about that addiction taking them down anymore. So I can't tell which of y'all it's going to happen to, but it's going to happen to some of you. My message is ask for help. Don't wait as long as I did. You've got administrators here. You've got parents here. You've got guidance counselors here. They know how to get help, and help is more readily available than it used to be. I promise you. So ask for help. I'm going to turn it over to Thomas. Thomas is on spring break this week, but he's here talking to y'all. That is really cool, and he's got a great story. Thanks. Hey guys, my name's Thomas. Um, so I bring meetings into uh, treatment facilities sometimes, or hospitals, or jails. Um, and normally when I start, I like to tell people that I don't work for the treatment facility, I don't work for any government agency, I don't work for the school. Um, the same thing is true here, I don't work for any of these people, I'm just a guy who got addicted to drugs, um, started off very innocently, and now I don't use them anymore, thanks to, uh, thanks to a lot of people's help. But um, I, 
I guess when I started using drugs was right at the end of high school, right in my junior year. I guess you guys are seniors, but I, uh, I didn't think I was going to use drugs. I didn't think I was going to drink. Um, but I was, it was summer vacation before my junior year, and somebody said, hey, do you want to um, do you want to try a whip it? And I was like, yeah, for sure. Like, I have no idea what that is. You guys seem to be having fun doing it. And I said, let's do it. And um, it was just that easy. I had it in my brain that I was never going to use drugs. I was never going to, you know, get super drunk or anything like that. But as soon as somebody offered me something, I said yes immediately. Um, and it kind of took off from there. As soon as I had it in my head that it was fun to do drugs, that I had like kind of like had a really good time um, doing that, um, I was willing to say yes to pretty much anything. I started smoking weed pretty much every day from that point on. Um, and nothing really happened while I was in high school. I didn't get in trouble. Uh, I got into college. Um, everything was cool. My parents never found out or whatever. Um, so it was, it was good. But then I went off to college, and uh, I'm from Virginia. I just moved here a couple months ago, and I went to this tiny little school called Longwood University in the middle of nowhere, Virginia. And um, there's nothing to do in, at Longwood University except for get drunk. There's absolutely nothing to do. 70% of the school was in Greek life, and I was not. So it was just kind of get drunk with the other 30% of the school who wasn't in a frat. Um, and that's what I did, and I almost immediately got kicked out. I got caught drinking and smoking weed in the dorms and uh, left that school after about a month and a half of uh, trying to go to college, so really made my parents proud there. But I went back to Northern Virginia up near D.C., started going to community college, and um, again in the summer, uh, a buddy of mine uh, said we were smoking weed or drinking or something, I was working at a pool and he was the head lifeguard and was like, hey, do you want to try this Percocet? And I was like, I have no idea what that is. And he said, oh, it's just, it just kind of makes you feel relaxed. Your muscles kind of just, you just kind of chill out, feel a little sleepy. And again, without even thinking about it, I was like, yeah, for sure, let's do it. And so I took it and I absolutely fell in love. Uh, it was the, one of the best feelings I've ever had in my entire life, if I'm being honest. And um, that, again, it started like a, started a, a, a new path for me. I started using it as often as I possibly could. And uh, like they were saying earlier, it's you, you, these, drugs are, these drugs are in your parents' medicine cabinet. I, they're in my grandparents' medicine cabinet because they both have like terrible arthritis, and this is what they're prescribed. It's what my mom has given for Xanax is what my mom has given for you know, taking long flights, stuff like that. So it's, a, it's around. Um, but even using it every day, I still managed to do pretty well in this community college that I was going to. So I moved to, um, to Richmond, Virginia. And uh, while I was in Richmond, I was still, sorry if I'm too loud. While I was in Richmond, Virginia, um, I was kind of doing the same thing, you know, drinking most days, just kind of having fun, going to class. Um, finding Oxys or Percocet or whatever I could find whenever I could. And I was sitting around one day and my buddy from high school came over. He lived down there as well. And he was like, uh, I, you know, I've got some, some heroin. Do you want to try it? And I was like, nah, I'm good. That's, like not, that's not my scene. It's, uh, it's, it's fine. And then he said, oh, well, you know, you're, you're doing Oxys all the time. And this is just, these are just Oxys, but it's just, it's just cheaper and it's stronger. And I was like, well, you kind of like buried the lead there. Like, why didn't you start with that? Like, let's, let's rock and roll. Like, let's do it. Um, <laughs> um, so that kicked off, obviously, like a not so great part of my life. And I started using heroin every day. And it's, it, he was exactly right. It's just Oxycontin. It's just the same stuff you find in the medicine cabinet, but way stronger and way cheaper. Um, but it doesn't it doesn't stay cheaper and it doesn't stay as strong as I need. It didn't stay cheaper and it didn't stay strong like I needed it to. It started off as a $10 a day habit and by the time I was done using it, it was about a $200 a day habit. So it got pretty pricey. Honestly, I don't even know where that money comes from. I like, can, I have a tough time paying my rent now and that, I do not have a $200 a day habit of anything. But, um, so I was like working these, I don't know, I was, I was working these like crappy jobs um, at these like bad restaurants trying to keep up with this habit and 
Um, they were talking about fentanyl and fentanyl and how like it's an epidemic and how it's killing people constantly. Um, but that fear and I, and knowing that these all these deaths are happening around me, right? I'm having friends drop left and right, just not like friends drop left and right, but people around me um, from from this from heroin and. Um, and, but that stuff really did not frighten me. When I heard you know, that somebody had like fallen out or overdosed or died from, from this, my first thought was not like, oh, that sucks. It was, where did he get it? Like, how am I gonna go find that drug dealer? How am I gonna go, and like, right, so I am, like, the people that I was with, we immediately flock to those things. We immediately go to wherever it's the strongest. And, what ended up happening is I, one morning I woke up, I started drinking, pretty much the moment I woke up, took some Xanax, and I was like, I think I'm gonna go for a bike ride. So I got on my bike, started heading around, realized I had tip money at this restaurant that I worked at, so I went down there and realized I had enough to you know, kind of get started for the day, so I went and saw my drug dealer. And um, he was like, hey man, be careful, this stuff is really strong. But every drug dealer in America says, hey, be careful, this stuff is really strong because they want you to think their stuff is good. But, so I was like, okay, yeah, whatever, you're full of it. Um, but I went into a 7-Eleven, I bought a red and a blue Gatorade. Um, I shot up in the bathroom and I remember walking out, paying for my Gatorades, walking outside, unlocking my bike, feeling kind of strange, so I was like, I'm just gonna sit on the curb for a second, and then I blacked out, completely gone. And I woke up in an ambulance, and uh, I said to the ambulance, to the guy who was uh, the EMT who was standing over me, like, what happened? And he was like, you overdosed. Your heart stopped, you stopped breathing. And I was like, so what, what, what does that mean? And he was like, well, we gave you Narcan, which is the drug that pulls the opiates off your opioid receptors. And I was, and my first reaction, because I was pretty like, obviously an addict at this point, was just like, F you man, like you blew my high, you, you screwed it up for me, I'm sick now, I don't feel good. This guy had just saved my life, and I threw up on his shoes and tell him, can I swear? Because I was like, I told him the f like I was, I, was, I was mad at this guy, right? He, he had, he, I, I was so caught up in like, the way I wanted to feel and so caught up in, you know, trying to get this drugs and really not caring about what anyone else thought of me, that this guy had just brought me back from the dead and I told him to screw himself. Um, but in no way did that stop me. I got out of the hospital and went and saw the same guy immediately afterwards. Um, but this kind of continued, you know, for a while. I. I kept going, kept working these crappy jobs, kept getting fired from jobs, started losing friends because I was stealing from them, doing whatever. Um, and you know, eventually I got so sick of it and my body was given out on me and you know, my mom and dad came down to Richmond, Virginia and rescued me and put me in this, put me in this rehab. Um, and you know, so ever since I've, I've been sober, I've been sober for about three years. But I guess the point of my story is, is that I, it started off like very innocently. It started off with someone saying, hey, do you want to try this? Hey, do you want to like party with us? And I said yes, because I thought that's what you know, I was supposed to do. It was really, really fun. I really enjoyed drinking. I really enjoyed smoking weed. I really enjoyed taking these pills. But it got so bad so fast, right? It got unbelievably awful so quickly and I couldn't, there was no way for me to realize how bad it was getting, there was no way for me to realize, there was no way for me to realize, kind of, there's no way for me to have like an outside perspective on it, right? I thought for the most, most of it, I thought I was doing fine, but the people around me were the people that I was affecting, the people, my friends, my family, those were the people that I was like really, really messing with. Um, so hopefully you guys, I mean, hopefully you guys got something from that. Um, but yeah, that's all I got. Thanks, guys. Hey, guys, let's give um, Thomas and Wood another round of applause for their stories.
honestly, it's hard for me to relate to that because you're looking at someone who's never taken a, a puff of a cigarette, much less any type of drug. But I think it's good for you guys to get it from Jason and I's perspective in, in terms of an enforcement perspective of what we've seen throughout our years with DEA and also to get it from a perspective of, of recovering addicts, firsthand stories. And Thomas, you said something that jogged my memory of an interview that I did with a, a young, not a young lady, middle-aged lady that we arrested for heroin. And during the course of my interview with her, she said that on four different occasions, she overdosed and her heart stopped. And the only reason that she was still alive was her friends were there with her and they brought her back to life on four different occasions. That sounds similar to the story that, you know, Thomas just related to you. Um, we've also seen cases where a 17-year-old female overdosed and what do her friends do? They're out of there. They, they left her there to die because they didn't want to have to worry about calling 911, calling the police, and having to explain to the police what was going on there. 17-year-old female left to die. That's what it comes down to. That's how addicting these drugs are. And as Mr. Marchin explained, how easy it was for him to get addicted just by smoking marijuana. I've interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people throughout my career of DEA, and every single one of them has started with, I started drinking alcohol, and I started smoking weed. Nobody ever told me they started shooting heroin as their first drug. It always starts with alcohol and weed, and it progresses. How much time do we have? Ten minutes? Guys, gals, do you guys have any questions for any one of us up here on this stage? Any questions or comments? Who has a question? I, I can't hear you. Here. I'm putting you on the spot. Um, I'm just curious, like, the effect that you think legalizing weed could have on the opioid crisis. So do people have trouble with alcohol? Yeah. People are going to have trouble with marijuana if it's legalized. And, and don't let this push fool you, people. This is the new big tobacco. And if you want to laugh and snicker and think it grows from the ground, so did tobacco. Millions of people have died from smoking tobacco. And... We'll see about the numbers. We don't have enough research yet, but it'll eventually happen. It's going to spread south, and it'll happen to the deep south a whole lot later than it will. I have a feeling he would agree. But this is a big money-making thing for a whole lot of rich folks. Don't be fooled. I, I agree. I totally agree with that. To me, when states started legalizing marijuana, marijuana is still against the law federally. When states started legalizing it, I took that as a slap in the face because I knew how dangerous and how addicting um, marijuana was. So I'm not going to go on my soapbox. I'll end it there. But I totally disagree with the legalization of marijuana. Any other questions? Yeah, if you could stand and speak, that'd be great. Yeah. I am hearing more of that can alleviate addiction but continues an addiction at times. I hear what you're saying. There are treatment centers out west that are saying, hey, come to my treatment center to get off heroin. We'll let you smoke weed. It's, a, it's another hook that some of these treatment centers are using to get people in because who wouldn't want to go to treatment where they could smoke weed all the time? He said it. Every addict I treated at the medical university, and we were a Suboxone clinic, so it's a clinic that helped people deal with their opiate addiction. Every one of them started out with either. And he didn't mention the third one. Either alcohol, marijuana, or nicotine, people. Fruity vapes have nicotine in them. They taste great, but you are becoming addicted. I was walking in with an administrator that said they confiscated one earlier. 
Hell, Thomas has one in his pocket right now. I mean, you know, I, I started... You just I started it. smoking after I got sober because I still needed to scratch an itch, you know? And now my lone remaining addiction is Starbucks. I can't drive within five miles of a Starbucks without my mind telling me, you need it, you need it, you need it. Addiction's hell, people. Guys, anybody else? Man, the sixth graders at Camp Road Middle asked some great questions. Yeah. Go. Go. So when some oh my god, so when someone's arrested for um for drug use, what are, what kind of treatment options do they have in jail? Like how do they get? Let me dispel a myth from your question right there. We take tremendous pains to not arrest addicts, and it is not a crime to be an addict. The problem with addiction is, as Thomas can probably attest, or even, even Wood can attest, your addiction drives you to do things, sometimes criminal things, that you otherwise wouldn't have done, and sometimes that involves becoming a drug dealer yourself. And it is not a legal defense to say, I was dealing drugs because I'm a drug addict. Th those two things are unrelated in the eyes of the law. But somehow there's a narrative out there that we go out and we arrest drug addicts. It, it just, that's not true. And I, I don't know where that narrative started, but it is patently false. Um, we, in fact, we have helped people we've arrested who committed crimes get into rehab, and then they also have to serve their sentence. I mean, we, we do our best not to introduce drug users who are at the low level uh, of a drug conspiracy, as we call it, um, into the system, uh, into the penal system, because it's, too, it's way too complicated for them. But sometimes, I've had a drug user, a guy who was addicted to Oxycontin and later got addicted to heroin, he said, Dude, me going to jail for five years was the best rehab you could have given me. He was a good kid from a good family, but he, he had stolen everything from his mom and dad. So it's a lot more complicated than the narrative of, oh, there's 80% of the people in jail are in jail for simple possession or just because they were users. That's a lie. I don't know where that stat came from, but it's not true. I'm not doing my job if I don't talk about something we see at the College of Charleston daily. And it's a big issue, and I'm sure it's not far from here, is Xanax. Um, as that is a prescribed medication for anxiety, uh, we see the abuse happening daily at the college. I had a student the other day tell me it's as easy to find a Xanax on campus as it is to find somebody else's Adderall. But what they're telling me is that it's not branded, meaning somebody's making this stuff and selling it downtown. The student also told me that he just takes a little bit because he doesn't know what it's been cut with. We've read about students at Clemson and other schools lately that have taken Xanax that have been cut with fentanyl and they die. So most of the deaths that we hear about that are opioid related, often there is a benzo involved because the message to the brain is, if I'm on a benzodiazepine, Xanax, Klonopin, and I'm on heroin, the message to the brain is, I don't need to breathe, I'm so relaxed. Do not play with that Xanax crap, I kid you not. It may make you feel good, and if you drink a little bit on it, you may even feel better. But somebody's gonna have to take care of you for the rest of the night, because they wanna make sure you don't pass out, throw up in your mouth, choke on it, and die. I kid you not. I used to teach at Charleston Day, sweet little downtown private school. I can name six kids that have died from that combination since I taught there back in the early 2000s. Margaret. So what are options for students here in relationship to perhaps talking with someone here at school to get help, um, to get some advice, to get some counseling if they have concerns about themselves or anonymous, anonymously about a friend? Yeah, I mean, I'd love one of the administrators here to ask that question, but we know there are local treatment programs, outpatient treatment programs at Charleston Center, which is downtown where I used to work, and then at the Medical University of South Carolina. But I'd love to hear from the principal about, you know, if somebody does have a problem, who do you talk to? 
Well, definitely talk to the, any, any adult that you trust in the building, whether it's your advisory teacher, a classroom teacher, but your guidance counselor and your administrator are definitely the go-to people. This Friday we're launching uh, the, the Stop It app. It's, a, it's an app where you basically go in there and you can report things like bullying going on, cyberbullying, uh, a threat to the school, but also people who are dealing drugs or just concerns and it's anonymous. I know that in today's age, no one really wants to go and talk to the principal face to face or maybe the guidance counselor because it's just a difficult conversation to have. But it's, a, it's a free app and it's designed for you to, to talk about all these issues because communication between us and you is what's going to make us safer and hopefully everyone here happier. Guys, the only thing I'll add to that is I, I told you I was invested in this community when I um, first came on stage. I am. If there's an issue with you or if you're concerned about a friend of yours, your principal and the administration here knows how to get in touch with Jason and I. And like Jason and I said, we are not interested in prosecuting addicts, okay? If you need to talk to somebody, get in touch with me, get in touch with Jason and maybe we can put you in touch with the people you need to to actually be talking to. We're not looking to try to lock you up, I promise you. We're just concerned about your overall safety and we don't want any more young people dying needlessly. So feel free to go to the administration and they can get in contact with me and I'll have a, a private discussion with you. They'll have my cell phone, they'll have my email, they can get in touch with me. And there are a lot of recovery meetings for young people in town. And, and you may think, oh my God, going to an AA meeting? But there are plenty for young people. Thank you all very much. And I said in my presentation, I didn't know who we were going to impact. But I hope someday we, you will know we impacted you.